Hello and welcome to Science Unscripted. It is Connor here. And Gabe. We're going to start off this time not with emails, but with comments. On on YouTube or what? On YouTube. Yeah, nice little reminder that we are on YouTube. Science Unscripted is on YouTube. The channel is called DW Podcast because there you can find all sorts of podcasts. And there you can watch us instead of just listening to us. Yeah. Which just enhances the experience. (laughs) Well, you might say it detracts from the experience. (laughs) You can decide. I'm just going to read a couple comments. One that sort of, it just made me happy. There's nothing really else to it. Um, It's from Kichira. Her 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 uh, her name is Kachira twenty twelve, mm. which means she might be twelve. Which it's it's great if we're reaching if that's her birth year. True. What if she just loves that year twenty twelve? It was a fun year, but a turning if, point in her life. You never know. In, in general, we are happy when our content somehow reaches young people. That's pretty cool. And she yeah. just says a nice find. I use YouTube mostly, even for listening on the go, and I like DW News, so it's a win win. So she found our channel for the first time. Mm. Um, one other comment here. This is from George Robinson. It was about our interview with uh, Edwin van Leuven. on chim- chimpanzee expert. Chimpanzees and this vending machine experiment and how you could teach a chimpanzee to do something that it couldn't do. And then it could teach other chimps. A chimp on its own can't innovate and figure it out. But if you teach one of the chimps, that knowledge spreads through the group. That's the whole point and how, how significant that is for all of human civilization, that we can do that. He says... This is one of the best interviews I've watched, and it has 103 views. What the hell, guys? <laughs> like, internet? Is he complaining to the internet? Watch this now. Since then, it's gone up, and my prediction to George was, I wrote him back and said, or I left a comment, give it a week, I think we'll be at 10 or 20 billion views, which would make it the most viewed. 10 or 20, as if there's no difference between 10 billion views. That would make it the most viewed video possibly of all time. Uh, But yeah. More than Gangnam style? Uh, That has been... Oh, come on. You're you're stuck in the past, my man. I think that got passed up by Despacito, who has been passed up by something else. Yeah. Yeah. So last one here. Um, This is from Dorothy. And uh, another person commenting on the toxic masculinity interview we did a while back. Mm. And she was just saying that she wants to feel safe in this world and it, it basically it, it, it angers her but it mostly it frightens her to imagine the world that in that case influencer Sterling Cooper was describing as his kind of ideal one where big burly kind of muscly men are protect women are protecting women and approaching them that way kind of as like like objects to be protected and uh, yeah her, her comment was about how and that, that she wouldn't feel safe in a world like that is that no she wouldn't. She doesn't want that world. She writes specifically, I prefer to have normal men around who are kind and will not play dominant, but approach me as a normal human being with equal rights and respect of boundaries, the same as I would approach them if I wanted to. And no need of protection, necessarily. Yes. So that that connects directly to some of the problematic messages being delivered through or by toxic masculinity influencers. I keep seeing, ever since we had that interview, I've seen so many random comments, often from teachers, saying that they're, they're sensing this kind, these, this messaging coming into the classroom in really young boys. Watch out for that and um, try to talk to, to young people about that. If you have kids, talk to them about how there's a lot of stuff on the internet that is just um, not good. I mean, we all know that. Hmm. But that, uh, yeah, it's important to treat. But in in particular, that it can seep its way into into adolescent psychology as very well. quickly, very young, yeah. very young. Particularly, that kind of message gets gets around quickly. You've got some science. I got yeah. Um, melatonin is a hormone. Sleep. It yeah, it's that hormone that our body sends out that that puts us to sleep or starts the process of falling asleep. In the morning, you go outside. And melatonin goes down because the sun is out. It's bright. Mm. At night, it goes up and starts that sleep process. This is like a thermometer that when it reaches the top, my body's like, oh, time to go to bed. Yeah, the light goes away, the melatonin goes up. The light comes out and the melatonin melatonin drops. Right, and a specific kind of light, blue light, short wave frequency light, so that if we are looking at our smartphones, at our screens, at night, the melatonin stays down. It's suppressed. There was a study done on this out of the University of Salzburg, and they, were, they wanted to look at different ways of reading. So they had three different ways of reading, and they looked at two groups, young kids and 
young adults. So mm-hmm. between 14 and 17 and 18 and 25. Mm-hmm. And they had them read smartphones with one of these blue light filters, so which takes away that short wave frequency light we were, that we were just yeah, talking about. Yeah, this would be like, I would imagine, a, 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 a translucent decal type thing that you would put a over. warm the, light. That, well, you would, you would, you would stick the, the translucent sticker over your phone's surface, right? Either you do that or you tell your phone and its preferences to, to, not, to, make, to, to be a warmer light. Okay, yeah. yeah. You can do it that way. And then the third way is by reading a paper book. So you've got smartphone with the filter a paper on. Paper book. Yeah, one of those. A, a one what? of those. One of those books that you hold in your hand. <laughs> a what? And turn the pages on it. Uh, okay, and they were they wanted to see what happened in these two different groups. So young kids and and adults, young adults. And what happened was in both groups, if you were reading without this filter on, so if you had this blue light getting into you right mm-hmm. before going to bed, mm-hmm. your melatonin went down or was suppressed. Right. So you're giving your your body a signal. No, no, no. Don't it's, go to bed. Don't don't start that sleep bed. process. Yeah. Right. It'd be so like in drinking. Both groups that happened. You're giving your eyeballs caffeine. Right. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Exactly. That is exact. Yeah. Exactly it. And for the young kids, they were able to recover quickly or more quickly than the than than, than the younger adults than these than these adults. Right. So the older you were, the less you able you were to get that sleep process going, even if you were looking at a smartphone, hmm. right? So the smartphone was worse for you when you were old. And they also put these people into a sleep lab called polysomnography, wanted to look at, technically at the quality of their sleep. And these older people had worse sleep, less of this restorative deep N3 sleep. And But according to subjective uh, yeah, assessments of their sleep, there was no difference. Oh, see, that's important. So yeah. they, they, both groups thought they slept well or, or as poorly or as well. Thought there was absolutely no difference. But there but was. There was. And by, if you extrapolate, the older you get, the more you flood your eyeballs with this blue light, mm. possibly the worse your sleep quality is going to be. Yeah. And the stronger the effect that it'll keep you awake when you don't want to be awake. So tips from this study. First of all, just put the phone away at night. Mm-hmm. In the last hour before you go to bed, just don't look at it at all. If you do, put on the blue light filter. If your phone has that function, put it on because it will definitely have an effect on the melatonin levels and probably that will have an effect on the quality of your sleep. If you're saying, I don't care, I'm just going to take a melatonin supplement. um, There was another study that was worked on late last year in the United States. This is melatonin levels in kids or they wanted to do a survey across the United States to see what percentage of parents were giving their kids melatonin, and it was up to 20% wow. in school-age kids. Even preschoolers, 6% of preschool kids. Oh, so this is like like the old stories you hear about, uh, rewind 100, 150 years ago, here's a, here's a dash of whiskey before yeah. bed, here's some opium. We There there has been no research done on what melatonin, it's a hormone, on what this hormone does to the developing mind, Right. Does it get in the way of puberty? Does it screw with glucose metabolism? We don't know. Do we know now? No. Oh, we still don't know. Oh, so parents. The, are... survey, the survey was just to figure out what what percentage of parents are giving their kids melatonin. It's crazy. One in five kids mm-hmm. is on melatonin, and one one out of four of those. I mean, this is a lot of numbers, but a quarter of those one in five are taking it every night. So instead of doing that... Put your smartphone away. Put your smartphone away. I'm going to retract a tip that I gave in the past, which was to use a smartphone lockbox. Because what? You had one and it didn't work? It broke. <laughs> Too fast. I, I ordered a cheap one on the internet, and that's my fault. So it, d- that's what I'm retracting. Don't order a cheap one on the internet. Yeah. Order a device, what it does. You put your phone in it. You set how many hours you want it to be locked away from you, which I cannot explain what a relief that is because you don't need any willpower. Not to touch your phone. It's it, gone. Th- you cannot make a choice. Y- you're, not, you're not forcing yourself not to. It's locked up. Right. Except mine isn't locked up anymore It's because bro- the thing's broken. So that's, you got some science for me? I do. We um, are limited on time. Our studio tech wants to get out of here. So come yeah, he's, on, no, make I know, this quick. I know. He's got to catch his train. So uh, I will make this quick. Yeah. Um, I was, obviously, you and I take a look at a lot of studies every single week. Yeah. I was stopped in my tracks. When? This week. L- physically? <laughs> you couldn't, I, yeah. couldn't move? Or? Yeah, I, I was... <laughs> I think eight minutes passed before I could even blink. 
No, the That's issue. That's why you were so weird. To... No. <laughs> the issue was there was a study that came out that seemed to completely contradict a study that you and I not only reported on, but where we got in touch with the researcher from Norway. That study was on sexual norms or perceptions, how we per- how men how men perceive women and how women perceive men when they are sexually active. Do you remember? Gave that interview and that... Uh, this was double standards, wasn't it? Sexual double standards. Do you, and actually, I'm going to quiz you on... Because you've got a pretty good brain for names. Yeah. Do you remember the researcher's name? Uh, Life Eric Olesen. Life... Very close. Life... Edvard... Edvard... Odesen... Olesen... Kinnear. Kinnear. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. So, uh, that was the guy we talked to. We're going to go back to him in just a minute here. German study from Saarland, from the south of Germany, came yeah. out and said that society... It basically confirmed everything you you already thought. Okay. If you're a man... With what did a, I think? What, what most people usually think. If you're a man who has a lot of sexual partners... Yeah. Everyone's like, woo That's fine. That's, that, you're, a, you're a great Good person. Good on you. Good Not, way to go, bro. Yeah. Nice work. If you're a woman, you're, viewed, you're only viewed more fav- favorably if you have fewer partners. Right? That's what society... And I'm thinking that, that completely contradicts... Uh, this this guy we talked to, except that it doesn't. He was referring specifically to Norway, Norwegian society? Not even that. It's it's deep in that. What this German study did was asked Germans to, to, to kind of imagine what they thought society would say. Hmm. And in that sense, they're not, necess- ne- not necessarily wrong, because it's very possible. That, that Extrapolating? Yeah, you're guessing, like based on TV shows and people you've talked to, how they would judge. Okay. I don't know if that's very important. I mean, it's important to some people to know how am I going to be perceived by society at large, of course. But I think it's a nice time to return to what I believe is the far more important research itself. Yeah. We're going to listen to a clip from Leif where he talks about how if you ask people, how do you feel about a sexually active man or woman? This is what they say. Science Unscripted. My name is Leif Edward Otterson Kinnair. I am Professor of Psychology at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, and we've recently published a study on sexual double standards. General opinion in society is that we do have a sexual double standard where women's sexual liberty is somewhat reduced compared to men, and men are sort of heroes if they have a lot of sex. Right, so the idea that a guy who has lots of partners is a, is a stud, right? He, it's, it's a good thing, it's a positive, and women, if they've had multiple partners, they are considered promiscuous, right? Right, so I suppose promiscuous is, is laden somehow, but if one just uses it as a descriptor, promiscuity is then considered positive for males and negative for women. That is the myth in society, or that's what people believe. And this is what people say that is true if you ask them, what do other people believe? So what is the norm in society? If you ask people that kind of question, this is what they will confirm. But if you ask people directly what do you believe, you get a different picture. And Life, the study that you have just done found something different, but you did it exclusively in Norway. Is that right? Yes. So our participants come from a highly sexually liberal country, highly gender egalitarian country and highly secular country. So so these are three things that can influence people's sexual psychology. First, we had different sexual behaviours, promiscuity, which is having sex with multiple, many partners, different types of self-stimulation, masturbation, and behaviours that were more akin to cheating and controlling and jealousy. Okay, so if I have a friend and I'm trying to recommend to that friend um, whether he or she should hook up with someone or or have a relationship with someone who's promiscuous, what were your findings there? In the short-term setting, we find that there is a greater leniency towards women's short-term history so or sexual history. So if your friend isn't considering a short-term relationship will be more lenient towards her having had a sexual history than him having had a sexual history. So if I'm understanding you, the, the, uh, it, it's reversed here. So for long term, we find a single standard. And for short term, we find a reversed double standard. So it's worse to be 
in this case, a guy who's been recently promiscuous if you're, I don't know, entering the dating scene, right? Because then you're going to be viewed, at least in Norway, as, as a less desirable partner. This is what we found. And it's, it's driven by different aspects. One of the aspects is that women have a higher sexual disgust than men. So in general, women are more negative to sex or more negative to sexual behaviors. And when men consider women who masturbate and when men, women consider men who masturbate, there is a difference in how, <laughs> how much of a turn on that is. What, is. what is that difference exactly? Women who masturbate sound sexy. Men who masturbate sound disgusting. Really? Why, 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 why is that? Because men have a general higher sociosexuality. So men are more geared towards short-term sex to start with. Women are more reluctant or more or, or less, what shall we say, their general level of turn-on is lower and their general level of sexual disgust is higher. Gabe and I grew up in a time and a place, and that was the United States in the 1990s. And this myth wasn't a myth. I, I can hear guys, you know, in in the schoolyard or in the in the courtyard calling women nasty names. The 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 girls at that point who'd had quite a few boyfriends or who had already had sex. Um and it didn't go the other way at that time. So I guess my question is why did that happen then to us? Why why were we surrounded by that? Well, I think it's important to then ask you at what age I'd say 12 to 18. Th yeah, 13, 14, 15 in particular. Yeah. yeah, so according to some other myths, there are no people who are more sexually conservative than, than prepubescent or pubertal boys. So boys around 14 years old seem to be extremely conservative. Uh, that doesn't necessarily say much about how this works among adults. The other thing is I... I think it's worth noting that the US is less secular, it's more religious, it's more conservative by far than Europe, uh, and especially Norway. And also, I think, in terms of sexual legality, it's uh, also quite far from Norway. And again, that was Leif Edvard Odesen Kinnear talking to us originally from, from Norway and reminding us that at the individual level, we, we don't judge people the same way as we think people judge each other at the societal level. And that for a lot of you out there, if you're in the dating scene, that's, mm -hmm. that's what really counts. Who cares about society? You're, you're sitting across the table from one other person. Yep. That's fundamentally what matters. What do you guys have to say about it? Let us know at su at dw.com. Science.